The robots are coming. If you're not familiar with the humanoid robot space, let me give you a primer. Tesla says that they expect to ship their humanoid robot next year, though we don't know exactly what ship means. Figure AI has entered a partnership with BMW to have their humanoid robot do useful work in a BMW factory next year. Mobile Aloha has demonstrated incredible dexterity using pinchers instead of hands while using human teleoperators, and they also demonstrated a 90% success rate at autonomously performing tasks with only 50 training examples. Sam Altman has recently pointed out that for the longest time, experts used to believe that AI would take over blue-collar tasks first, white-collar tasks second, and creativity maybe never. But in reality, we're almost seeing the exact opposite, with AIs like Midjourney being able to create images with close to perfect accuracy, and AIs like ChatGPT being able to manipulate text proficiently, although not yet reliably. While AIs that power real-world tasks like autonomous driving and humanoid robots are only now starting to become actually useful. What is clear though is that real-world AI will soon be solved too, and this means that the robots are coming, and with them come the concerns of mass unemployment and societal collapse. If history is anything to go by, then these concerns are unfounded, but it might be wise to be open to the idea that this time it is different. So hello YouTube, I'm Michael Size, and in today's video I want to present my arguments for for why this time it is actually not different. My argument has three pillars, and I'll go into detail in a moment, but the pillars are as follows. Pillar number one, the value creation that happens when humanoids replace human labor will be distributed primarily to the final consumer via lower prices. The overwhelming majority of the cost savings will not go towards profits for the manufacturer and it will not go towards profits for the robot supplier. The companies will enjoy some of the value of course, but the overwhelming majority will go to the final consumer. Pillar number two, as the prices of goods and services decrease linearly, the demand for goods and services increases exponentially, so total demand for labor is actually gonna go up. This is way easier to understand with an example, so consider the auto industry. At some point, humanoids will have displaced 10% of the labor that goes into a car, by which I mean the total labor, including suppliers and so on, and at this point, the cost of the car is perhaps 9.5% lower. By pillar 1, 9.5% lower costs will translate into perhaps 9% lower price to the final consumer, and a 9% reduction in the price of the cars should result in perhaps 18% higher demand, so we've decreased the labor per unit sold by 10%, and we've increased the number of units sold by 18%, and that results in a net 6.2% labor demand increase, not decrease. This is a known phenomenon. Pillar number three, at some point, the market might saturate in the sense that everybody will have so many goods and services available to them that they literally won't be able to consume anymore, we still have only 24 hours in a day after all, but at that point we can still avoid mass unemployment for a lot longer by reducing the number of hours worked per lifetime. I know this is a lot to take in, and I don't blame you if you're feeling a little lost right now, but don't worry, we're now gonna make it make sense, starting of course with pillar number one. Throughout the course of human history, probably 99% of all costs that companies incur while making a product have been cut, and yet corporate profit margins remain around 10%. For example, a farm tractor can do the work of 500 humans with hand tools. A semi-truck can move around as much cargo as 30,000 humans with backpacks. The latest Nvidia GPU is able to do as much 
compute as 20,000 of the first NVIDIA GPUs and fiber to the home can provide as much bandwidth through one connection as dial-up internet could through 18,000 connections. All of this ultimately represents cost cutting and yet truckers aren't making $300,000 an hour nor is Nvidia selling the 4090 for $5 million. They make their profits of course but the vast majority of the value generated goes to the customer. But the retrospect doesn't actually tell the whole story and it's important to understand that there is a certain process before we can get to this point. If you have company A who is making consumer products and company B who sells equipment to businesses such as company A, well company B might come up with a product, say a humanoid robot, which costs them a thousand dollars to provide and has the potential to help company A save ten thousand dollars in labor costs. At the beginning, the robot supplier might sell their product for $5,000, so they make $4,000 in profits, and company A is happy to purchase the robot because it makes them another $5,000 in profits as a result. So in the short term, both of them get to increase their profit margins. In the medium term, however, the robot supplier will gain competitors and as more humanoid robot offerings arrive, they might have to cut their prices to perhaps $1,500, which is still a lovely 30% gross margin, but nowhere near the 80% that they had previously. So company A is now saving $8,500. But just the same, company A's competitors will get humanoid robots as well and they will start competing for market share. Company A, as well as its competitors, now have to give up perhaps $8,000 of those savings and pass them on to the customers just to keep their prices competitive. And in fact, all other competitors in the space will have no choice but to implement the humanoids so that they can capture the cost savings and use them to cut prices, because in the medium term, it's no longer an optional step to pad profits, it's now actually actually a mandatory step in order to remain competitive. So at this point, of that $9,000 of value creation, $500 goes to the robot supplier, $500 goes to the manufacturer of the consumer product, and $8,000, the overwhelming majority of the value creation, goes to the customers themselves. All of these are necessary steps in the process of economic growth. In the short term, the companies that are creating and implementing the value creation technology need a profit incentive to do so, because otherwise why would they even bother? So the part where they pad their profits for a while cannot be skipped, but in the medium and long term, the value creation will be passed on to the customer either via competition or in rare cases via government antitrust enforcement. At this point, the first pillar should hopefully make sense to you. When costs go down by any means, eventually prices follow. Moving on to the second pillar, I said that this one is a known phenomenon and that's because it's just a variation of the Javon's paradox. The original paradox observed that as the efficiency of coal use in industry went up, the prices of the final products and services went down, but the lower prices made the demand for those products increase exponentially and so the total amount of coal demand actually went up as a result. In our example, we're simply replacing coal with labor and we get the same paradox. A lot of people are referring to humanoids as automating labor or as reducing the cost of labor, but thinking about it in that way is only going to confuse you more. If it's done by a human, it's labor, and if it isn't done by a human, then it's not labor. And so what humanoids actually do is they decrease the labor content of goods and services, just like technology decreased the embedded coal content back in a 1865. And as the labor content of goods decreases, the price of the goods decreases as well, but the demand goes up exponentially because of this, so the total demand for labor actually goes up. 
Now, when I say that the price decreases, it doesn't necessarily actually mean that the price in dollars goes down. If that were to happen across the whole economy, that would mean deflation, and we know that central banks don't want to let deflation happen. So, what is more likely is that prices in general stay about the same or even go up slightly, but hourly wages go up way faster. So, the products become cheaper in terms of how many hours of work it takes the average person to be able to buy the product, or in other words, affordability goes up. And we have precedents for this as well. In fact, I believe that this is happening in the American economy right now as a result of an explosion in productivity. Except that this productivity increase right now is being achieved by traditional means and not by humanoid robots. So when the automation comes, labor actually becomes more valuable. And this sounds crazy, but we've walked through the steps and we have historical precedent, so the the only conclusion that I can get from this is that when the robots arrive, labor will become more valuable. And this logic keeps working for as long as we keep buying more stuff. When robots take over 90% of existing jobs, that means that we need to buy 10 times more stuff if we want everyone to work the same number of hours as today. When robots take over 99% of existing jobs, we have to buy 100 times more stuff, and when they take over 99.9% .9 of jobs, we have to buy 1000 times more stuff. And to be clear, it's not necessarily more stuff as in volume, but more quality adjusted stuff, so perhaps we don't buy 10 times more cars, we just buy cars that are 10 times better. Another option is that cars get 10 times cheaper, but we neither buy 10 times more cars, nor 10 times better cars, we just take the savings from spending 10 times less on the car, and use the savings to buy something entirely different, and that just means that the new labor demand occurs in a different sector of the economy. But the fundamentals remain unchanged, and this too is a recognized variation of the Jevons paradox. But people argue that robots and AI in general are actually going to take over everything, which means that all of our incomes will be precisely zero, so therefore none of this makes sense. And okay, maybe eventually they will, but there's still going to be a process to that. They're not going to take everything over tomorrow, or even in the next decade, and if we have a billion bots by 2044, even that is probably only going to take like 20% of all jobs. So we have plenty of time to let this play out and observe and make better decisions once we have at least some actual data. Now, when it comes to buying 10 times more stuff or a thousand times more stuff, we don't know exactly how far this can go, but for some comparisons, Americans buy around 10 times more stuff than the average global citizen, so we can probably do a 10x at least, and in the past 1000 years, we've already increased this by a hundred times in developed countries, so we have precedent for large increases as well. Some people even argue that the real number is closer to infinity, because we don't have to be constrained to this planet, or even to the solar system, and I don't know how likely that is, but it definitely seems like a reasonable possibility. But even if that doesn't happen, we still have pillar number 3 to consider, and that's the idea that we can decrease the number of hours worked per lifetime. For example, we can reduce people's time in the workforce from 5 500 months today to just one month, and we can decrease their shifts from 8 hours to 4 hours, and we can even go back to single earner households, and just between these three possibilities, that's already a factor of 2000. Combine this with a factor of 1000 increase in stuff purchased, and we get a factor of 2 million, which means that the robots would be able to take 99.99995% of our jobs, and we could still keep everybody employed. To be very explicit, I'm talking about a scenario where your whole life, you go to work for only one month, 
and your shifts are only 4 hours and in that time you make enough money to last you and your spouse and your children for the rest of your life while buying 1000 times more stuff per person than what we buy today. This would be possible because robots and AI do almost everything, so our productivity per hour of human labor is 2 million times larger. Presumably at this point minimum wage would be 15 million dollars an hour after adjusting for inflation, so labor would certainly be getting more valuable. And while this scenario might sound like fantasy when you just sum it all up like this, if you look at the process by which we arrived at it, it is perfectly reasonable. Every argument makes sense, we didn't make any leaps in logic to get here and everything has historical precedent. The whole history of humanity is one of exponential growth and all I did is project the same exponential further. So my final message and the reason why I decided to make this video is a bot induced labor surplus isn't coming anytime soon so do not rush to over regulate humanoids. And I'm not hoping to get through to the Luddites, you know, the people who will want to ban the bots outright, they're too far gone. My target audience is the smart and serious people who are already discussing possibilities on how to tax the bots and how to manage the impact on society and I just don't think that such a thing will be necessary and in fact I believe that rushing into regulation like this is potentially actually dangerous. That being said, I do support UBI, not because because I think it will be necessary, but just because I think it's a good idea, so if your solution is UBI, we can find some common ground right there. My about page says near futurism, and that's the factor which connects this video to my content on renewable energy. If you want to explore near futurism with me in the, well, in the near future, the best way to do it is to like and subscribe. Thank you for watching and make sure to comment. I read all your comments.